Yes. All right. Well, welcome back to Grace Baptist Church. So our Sunday school, we've been going through Hebrews. So we finished uh, verse 9 last time. So we're going to pick up again in verse 10. So what we normally do, we will read, take turns reading. So um, I'll start first, verse 10, then Jen, if you could do 11, and then we're going to stop at verse 12 today. Hebrews, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Um, they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Okay. You want to read? Okay. Sure, as of Esther, thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same. And thy years shall not fail. Thank you. So there's a lot more packed in this little piece than we might think. So one of the unique things I want to say first off, how many times does that talk about us? How many times does it say you, we? If we look at it again. No times. This little segment of verses is only talking about Jesus, only talking about God, together. This is a continuing what we were talking about last week. God is introducing Jesus to the world. He's talking about what Jesus is like, what's special about Jesus, what's different about Jesus. And he continues in this week by talking about Jesus and the world. So we know from the beginning of John in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So Jesus has been around since the very beginning of time. And so that's where we start with our Hebrews passage as well. It's Jesus in the very beginning. He says, in the beginning he laid the foundation of the earth. So that's where Jesus starts. Before anything else, before angels, before people, before time, before the world. That's where Jesus is. And we have record, Jesus and God were in fellowship together, all together, completely happy with themselves, before any of time happened. So, it's been a while. Jesus has been with God for quite some time. Now, we haven't. We, on the other hand, have a very little slice of time. And, on top of that, we're in time. Jesus has existed before time as well. So this is very different from what we are, what we can be, and it's one of the things that makes Jesus special. It's one of the reasons that he really knows God, because not only is he God, but he's been with God for all of time. We also see he's before all things, in Colossians 1.17, he's before all things, and by him all things consist. So not only is he, does he exist before everything, but he's also the one upholding everything. In the beginning, when God said, let there be light, he said, he said it, he spoke with words. Jesus is the word of God. When God wants to communicate something to us, when God wants to change something about the world, he sends words. We see this with his prophets. Every single time he had a message, he sent it to a prophet. And the prophet told people. When he was talking to Elijah, he did not come in the whirlwind. He did not come in the fire. He came in the voice. He came in the word. At the very beginning, he didn't come down to Adam and Eve in a big blaze of glory. He didn't come in a big rush of water. He came and he talked with them. So from the beginning... God's interactions with people have been based on words. And Jesus himself is the word. He's the main word. So in creating the world, in putting people in it, Jesus has been the center of how God talks to man. And he still is. He's still just that important to how the world works and to who we are in it. 
But the world doesn't last forever. The world waxes old. It means it gets old. It falls apart. So part of that, today I've found an old pair of my gloves. Brought these from the USA. I wore these back when I worked in fast food. So every morning we would take a big truck, we would unload boxes into the freezer. So these got a little scuffed up. They're starting to turn green, their cover's starting to come off. There's a big cut in the thumb, there's a cut in the finger from where I was opening boxes and missed. And then there's also a couple places the color's going away or where the seam is coming apart. These are pretty old gloves and I've used them a lot. But these aren't really as old as the world. And yet to God, the time's about the same. The world waxes old, just like an old glove. The world falls apart, loses color. But here, God's not talking about gloves. He's not talking about short-term things. He's talking about the world. The world gets old. These are things like the mountains, things like the oceans, things that we've had forever. In God's perspective, these things get old really fast. Now, when you look out in Korea, you see all the cities that are getting built up, all these buildings, but you also see the mountains. The mountains have been there forever. The mountain, you can build on the mountains, you can build around the mountains, but the mountains themselves have not changed. They've been there for all of while Japan was here, all of before Japan was here, and even now, afterward. Western influence doesn't change the mountains. Japan coming in doesn't change the mountains. North Korea, South Korea doesn't change the mountains. And yet, that time that we see, all that time that nature has not changed at all, God says, that's like an old glove. It got old, it gets thrown away. It turns old. But, by contrast, Jesus does not. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall wax old, as doth a garment. So Jesus is not only interacting with us, he's not only supporting our world, but the world gets old, and he doesn't. He doesn't change. He doesn't fail. Even when the entire universe created by God's word will pass away, the word of God doesn't. The word of God remains forever. Next part, as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So the vesture means clothes. So when you get an old glove, when you finish using clothes, they go in the trash. And then you take out new clothes, and you put them on. These are new gloves. They're not old, they have not been used to move big boxes of burgers around. The seams are still good, no miscol miscoloration, I haven't cut them up yet. I'm pretty clumsy, so I probably will at some point. But that's, these are new gloves. It is just as easy for God to change the world as it is to put on a new pair of gloves. Old world, new world. To Jesus, that's the amount of time it takes for all of time to finish and for the new worlds to start. But he seems pretty invested in this world in that short span of time. Because it's in that short span of time that he came to our world. He came to our time and he lived in a body that could wear out. He knew our infirmities. He knew our pains. He slept. He was exhausted. He helped heal the sick, so he knew what being sick was like. He, lived, he died on the cross, so he knows what death is like. All of that in the little span of time that's just like an old pair of gloves. Because while time itself is very short, for God, for us, we are very important to God. But God should be far more important to us. That's one of the reasons that this passage only talks about God. It's getting our focus right. It's helping us understand who we are compared to God. Because that's a very important perspective to have. God has lasted forever. We have not. God is powerful. We are not. 
God can take off and put on realities like gloves. We can't. We are limited by all those things. But we don't like to think that, do we? We like to think that the world really does revolve around me. And me, a little tiny flake on an old glove, and more important than the God who can change or create realities at will. But until we're humble, until we know that without God, we really are just a tiny piece of an old glove, until we know that, until we believe that, we can't be useful and we can't produce fruit. So that is what Hebrews is talking about. But the passage that he quotes here actually comes from Psalm 102. The psalm is very different, because the psalm talks a lot about us, and it mostly talks about people. So Hebrews talks about the God part, Psalms talks a lot about the us part. So let's go to Psalm 102. There's a little tag at the beginning of Psalm 102. It says, A prayer of the afflicted when he's overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. If we're a piece of an old glove that doesn't really matter, it would be very easy for us to be afflicted, for us to be overwhelmed. We're not built to last. People are not designed to be God. We're designed to be people. We're designed to need God. We're designed to be imperfect. That's why God came to Adam and Eve every day in the garden, because they could not function without him, and they weren't built to. They were built to need him constantly coming, constantly refreshing, constantly loving. We're not designed to be independent. I know, like, we, we just, America, we just celebrated Independence Day. We, we like our independence, but... In spiritual matters, we're not designed to be free from God. We're not designed to operate independently. We're designed to be put in with God. The illustration Romans uses is uh, grafting a tree. So, I'm not a botanist, but grafting, it's an interesting process. You have a tree. You have branches on the tree. And then you have the branches produce fruit. When you graft a tree, you cut off one of the branches. You take a new branch from a different tree, and you stick them together. And then you tie them together with some sort of little tape or rope, and you leave them there. Eventually, this tree will start to push nutrients into the new branch. And the new branch will grow into a part of that tree. So the old tree has a new branch from a different place, and that new branch gets nutrients. That new branch eventually produces fruit on a tree that it did not come from. That's the illustration given to us about our salvation. Jesus also talks about us, him being the vine, where the branch is. So he's the old thing. He's the thing that's been there. He's the thing with the life flowing through him. We're the little piece he stuck on because he wanted to, and he says, we bear fruit now. It's his power. We're a dead branch. It's his nutrients. We can't produce anything. And the fruit is not for us. The fruit is for him. So this is the perspective. Jesus, lasting forever, needing nothing. Us, lasting a very short time needing everything. Job 14.1 is a fairly well-known verse. Man born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Now, at the time they were talking about this, Job was having a lot of trouble. Satan was attacking Job, and Job was pretty depressed. But the statement is true. Man is of few days and full of trouble. It's he goes on to talk about, it's like a worker working one shift. You come into work, you start at the big morning, finish at the end of the day. That's a normal work shift. Our life is not like a work week. Our life is like one work shift. We have a start, we have an ending, and we have one shift 
to finish whatever it is we're going to do. Very short. It's not like a tree that produces fruit and then next year produces fruit, next year produces fruit. People have one season. We're not a flower that, we're like a flower. We have one season to bloom, produce fruit, and then the flower goes away. And then next year, different flowers come. So we are limited by time. G Jesus is not. So one thing to think about, where are we looking for strength? Where are we looking for purpose? Are we looking for us, who can't exist more than a hundred years at very best? Or are we looking to Jesus, who has existed, will exist, and promises to make us part of his continued existence, to make us part of the vine? So John 15, 16, Jesus talks about, in all of John 15, Jesus talks about his purpose as the vine, us as the branches. But in verse 16, he talks about the fruit. We've talked about how we need to produce fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All of that together is the result of somebody looking like God, living like God, acting like God. But the fruit isn't for us. Looking at John 15, 16. You haven't chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So we talk about making the fruit. The fruit lasts. We don't last. We end time. We move on to rest with God. Our shift is done. But what we make, the fruit, lasts. The fruit stays. And that is why God wants us to make it. God says, work with me. I can give you something that lasts. Work with me. I can make you part of a story that's bigger than you. Work with me and you won't be swept in with the wages of sin being death, meaninglessness, emptiness, you won't be part of that majority of the world that will gain nothing from their lives. God promises us something real. God promises us something that lasts, something that we can't create by ourselves and that he could create without us. But he says, I want to use you. I want to talk to you. I want my word to be in you and I want you to produce fruit to remain. Because God is still the Word. He still wants to talk to us, and He still wants us to listen and to obey Him. So that's the few days part. Now I move on to the full of trouble part. Life is hard, and that's hard for everybody. Life is harder for the unsaved person, though. The unsaved person doesn't know where to look for help. They can look to some places and think they're getting help. They could look to money and then worry about how they're going to get money. They could look to family and then worry about when their family goes away. They could look to friends and then worry about not having any friends. They could look to themselves and then worry because they know their own weaknesses. They could look to the general state of the world and become very depressed immediately because the world's not getting any better. There are lots of idols people can make. There are lots of things people can tell themselves to try to forget the world is falling apart. We don't have to do that. God promised us the world would fall apart. He says, the heavens will wax old. I will change them like a garment. He also said, in the end days, perilous times would come. And he told us the world would get more sinful. The world would get worse. That's not a surprise. And it shouldn't really be something we treat like a surprise. If God's right, then the world will be wrong. So, our focus shouldn't be on how bad the world is, but on how good God is. How he's still involved. How he still loves us. How he still cares for us. And he's still giving us just as much strength today to face the problems today. A lot of times, 
This is something I heard in a sermon recently. A lot of times we become comfortable with the power God gives us right now. We, we experience God. We learn something. We become like God in one way. And we stop there. Because in order to beat this sin, I need to remember this truth about God. Well, sin changes. People find different ways to disobey God. They find worse ways to disobey God. They find more ways to fight against Him. And so God also gives us more grace. He gives us life more abundantly. But a lot of us sit on the life we already have in Christ. A lot of us think about the truths we already know. Instead of going back to God and getting more of Him to deal with more of sin. If the world is getting worse, Christ is just as good. But we need to keep refreshing ourselves. We need to keep going back to the vine to get the nourishment. Because even if we produced fruit one time, we still need the vine in order to produce more fruit. And God's goal is that we produce much fruit. So that should be our goal as well. We have no purpose outside of producing fruit. The good thing is, God, it, God knows this. God knows life will be hard, and He knows He can help us. You know, in Matthew 28, or 11, 28, it says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. So a yoke was a big piece of wood you would put on top of cows, so they would pull a plow, break up ground, so you could plant seeds. The yoke that they used was always a two-cow yoke. Cow on right, cow on left, wooden piece, and the plow that they would pull through the dirt. So Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. That's a two-cow yoke. Jesus isn't saying, do my job. He says, join me. I'm already pulling the yoke. I'm one of the cows. I want you to join me, walk beside me. Now Jesus is doing all the pulling power. Jesus is doing the heavy lifting. Jesus is giving us the spirit strength we need to live for him. But we're there too. And if one cow stops moving, and the other cow keeps going, there's going to be problems. Because this cow is dragging that cow, and life is very hard for the cow that doesn't want to move. Same thing with us. If we join Christ in salvation and we are not walking with him, life is still going to be hard. We're going to be dragged behind as God tries to make us more like him and we try to kick against that, like Paul at the very beginning. So he says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Still a burden, still a yoke, still hard work, but it's light work because Jesus is carrying the load. The word patience in the, in the Greek language is also very similar. The word talks about, it's like a picture. It's the word you use for a camel that's carrying a load. So when you would put something on a camel, the camel would sag down and then would adjust to the weight. He would bear up under the weight. The more you add to the camel, the more he has to bear up under. So the word for patience is the word for the camel coming back up after the load. So something hard happens. Camel bears up. Something difficult comes into life. Camel bears up. You have something come up at work you did not expect. The camel bears up. The load gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And eventually for a real camel, they're going to break. They're going to fall. The straw is going to break the camel's back. But we don't rely on a camel. We rely on Christ. We rely on his power. And his power does not give out. That's why we can have that patience. That when life gets hard, God supports. When life gets harder, God supports. And 
even though we suffer just as much and even more than the unsaved world, we are far better equipped to deal with it because we have God's strength helping us to carry that load and to even have joy while we do it. Then looking at our future, we talked about man is a few days full of trouble. The verse doesn't really talk about man's future. Because if man is if people aren't listening to God, they really have no effect on the world. The world's going to end. The old glove is going to get thrown away, and Jesus is going to make a new world. Jesus is going to be king. Jesus is going to be leader. Sin is going to be gone. That'll be amazing. Except for the people who live for sin. Because they are going to be gone with the old world. Everything they live for, old glove in the trash can. Everything they want, old glove in the trash can. Every good goal they had is just an old glove in the trash can. But anything done for Jesus is going to last. Jesus said he would reward people for giving a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple. You could give somebody a cup of cold water because you love them in Christ, whether they're saved or not. And that does not go unnoticed. That does not go unrewarded. And something as simple as buying someone a coffee, I know that's hot water, but you know, it's pretty similar. Buying somebody a coffee can have eternal importance because if you do it because God says love others and you're loving others. Something as simple as walking to work because God says work and I'm getting to work can it be internally important because it ties into God's story. God says in 1 Corinthians, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That means we can eat to the glory of God. We can drink to the glory of God. Anything you can do in life can be done to the glory of God. So is it? Are we actually eating lunch to the glory of God? Thankful to God for giving us lunch. Thankful to God for giving us the people we can eat with. Thankful to God for giving us the long chain of supply that gave us the lunch. Are we walking to work for God's glory? Or are we walking to work because we have to get to work? Question I have to ask myself a lot. Even having fun. You know, having fun is good. God has given us times to rest, times to enjoy what he's given us. But having, we can have fun in God, or we can have fun for ourselves. We can have fun appreciating what comes from God, being thankful to him, or we can forget where it came from and have fun that doesn't really do anything for us. So all of this, this is how we live into the future. This is how we actually matter, is by living for God. Eating, drinking, and doing everything to the glory of God. That's only possible, though, if we interact with God, and we constantly realign ourselves in Him. So we looked at man, we looked at Jesus, now just a little bit of a last look at what our response should be. I'm going to go to Romans 8 for this one. Romans 8.22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. This is us. The world's getting old. We're getting old. We don't like the world. The world is hard. We're being burdened. But we have a hope. And that's what's different between us and the rest of the world. We have a hope because we have Christ. We have a Christ who is eternal, a Christ who made the world, the God who gives all good blessings, the God who gives us 
everything we need to live, the God in whom we live and move and have our being. All these things are God. All these things are things we can get in God. These are our hope. Romans 8, 24. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? If we saw Jesus coming down right now, standing in front of us, destroying all evil in the world, we wouldn't have to hope for the future. It'd be now. And that would be great. It'd be great to have everything in life fixed by Christ right now. Christ comes, Christ sits on the world, he rules over everything. But we're hoping. Every single generation of Christians has had a similar but slightly different hope. When God said to Adam, I will send a redeemer to fix your sins, Adam had a hope. Like the name Cain is, I've gotten a man from the Lord. When Eve named Cain, the very first, her very first child, she thought, this is it, this is the Messiah. This is the man I got from the Lord who's going to fight against our sins and who's going to save us. Well, she was wrong because that he was not the Savior, in fact, he was the first murderer. But the hope was there. Then, later on, we have the hope of Israel. We have the hope of Abraham. Abraham was promised a son. He hoped for that son. He believed God. And God met that hope. But Abraham never saw the whole nation Israel would become. He hoped for that. He was confident it would come. Then, when Israel was in Egypt, they hoped for being free. And for 400 years, they weren't free. There were generations of Israelites who died hoping for freedom to come. There was also a generation that was freed and who died in the wilderness hoping for the promised land. There were people who came to the promised land and sinned against God. They were hoping for peace. They were still, then there's David who is hoping for a Messiah later on in his bloodline. There are people, after Israel's taken into captivity, they hope again to be returned. The people of God have always lived on hope. They have always lived believing that God will fulfill his promises. And God, so far, has a perfect track record. But he also, pro he doesn't pr just promise us hope for the far future. He promises us hope for the next five minutes to live, to move, to have our being, to be in Christ, and to live five minutes that will matter for eternity. Now we also do have that long-term hope that one day he's coming again to reign over the world. We will reign with him as kings and priests. Revelation 1, 5, 20. But we can't see that hope. Tell me what we can see. We can see the fulfillment of God in the promises of today. We can see God today. We can interact with God today. And we can listen to his word and let it change us today. And that, build, that hope builds up our confidence in God. So if I told you, I will buy you a free coffee, some of you would believe me, some of you wouldn't. I really like coffee, so... And so, some of you might just stop there. Okay, he said he'd buy me coffee. Some of you might come to Starbucks, and then I would buy you a coffee. If you actually came to Starbucks, you did extra work, you took extra risk, you spent extra energy because you believe me, and you get a coffee. Now, if I said, I will give you a coffee every single day you come to Starbucks, First of all, none of you would believe me, and I can't because I'm not that rich, <laughs> and this Starbucks is pretty far away from where I live. So, but if, assuming that worked, assuming you did come to Starbucks every day, and I bought you a coffee every day, after one month, two months, three months, you would be very, very confident that the next day I would buy you a coffee. Now, I might stop one day. So your confidence might be misplaced.
But when God chooses to bless us, when God chooses to fulfill promise day in, day out, God promises he doesn't change. I might change. I might refuse to buy you coffee. God does not change. He does not refuse to give you the power you need to live life like him. So the more we hope, the more we need God, the more we are upset because we don't have him, the more we're happy when we do have him, the more confidence we have in our God. That confidence is our future. That confidence is where we rest. That confidence is what we live for. That is our hope. But we only get that if we look at Jesus first. And then we look at ourselves in comparison. We'll go back to Psalm 102 to wrap up. So the whole psalm, I know we didn't read it, but the person who writes it is upset. He's being attacked by lots of people. He's got physical problems. He's got problems with his resources. This guy has a lot of problems. And we see in some places it's because he disobeyed God. Or he's not depending on God. And now, because of that, God's put him down. God has humbled him. And now his enemies are laughing at him. Now his enemies are laughing at God too. But this person comforts himself by knowing that he is weak. He doesn't say, I, I'm strong in the Lord. He says, I'm weak and I need the Lord. Go down to verse 24. I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Then the response what it means for him. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. No matter how hard life gets, no matter how old and dirty the glove becomes, the people who follow God have a generation. The people who follow God have a line. You can trace from Adam all the way down to Jesus, all the way down to us, the people who follow God. There's always few of them. They're always a small part, a remnant, a leftover. But that leftover has been able to change the world because God's working through them. We are part of that leftover. Is God working through us? That's the end. Any, any comments? Questions? Criticisms? <laughs>